All right, guys, welcome back to First Attack. I'm going through all of the different runs here, different the ladder of fighting game strategy. I've been talking to some people during the chat here, <coughs> and actually, I, I definitely want to give shout-outs to Blink Templar in here because he asked a really, really good question. And I'm really glad he as asked this question because it is super important. The question that he asked is, so... Top players also use low-level strategies. So let me go back to the slides here and show you back here. Let's go back to one-player games and stuff like this. And let's go back to patterns. You can... There is no question that the highest level of players use all of these tactics. One-player games and patterns. 100%. They, they use these strategies because a lot of the times when they go in and I will talk about this kind of summary at the end but it's a great question and I, I, I want to address it right now but um definitely it is something that they will use and in fact almost all top players when going against a, an opponent that they don't that they don't know that they've never played again they will start with these they will start with patterns. They will start with one player kind of games. And that's what they use to figure out how the computer plays. And once they figure out, I mean, not the computer, the, the opponent plays. That's how they figure out how the opponent plays. And once they figure out how the opponent plays, that's when they start jumping into the next levels. But again, I'll go into that in a little bit detail because there's a little bit more that I want to get into besides just that. Okay, so let's go to the next thing here. Uh, next thing, shenanigans. What are shenanigans? I talk about shenanigans all the time on stream. I mention shenanigans. Oh, he just went for a shenanigan. In fact, when Sokka won the, the, the Capcom Cup, and see, here's a great example of it. When he caught him with the Raging Demon, I yelled at the top of my lungs, and he goes for the shenanigans! And it's because he, he really did. He just went for a shenanigan. And it 100% worked. So, again, even the best players winning a Grand Finals match at a really stacked tournament will be using things such as shenanigans. <clears throat> so what is a shenanigan exactly? So basically, shenanigans are something that you're going to be doing to catch someone off guard. That you're, you're, you're using a tactic because they're asleep at the wheel, or you're using a tactic that you're hoping your opponent just doesn't know how to stop. That's basically all it is. It's something better than a pattern because it's not something that you'll commonly use. It's just a small thing. It's a small trick. Right? It's a trick that you can bust out every once in a while. So let's go back to um, this again. Let's go back to the screen. Let me show you guys an example of shenanigans. I'm going to go back to Cami again. <clears throat> actually, I probably should have swapped them around, actually, now, now that I think about it. Let me do that real quick. Apologies, guys. Character change. Doo -doo 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 -doo. So... Let's put Ryu here and Kami here. So this is a shenanigan. Kami, so most people, so let me, let me go over the slides a little bit more. Let me go through some more of the bullet points. Um, again, you're counting on your opponent's knack of, lack of knowledge or you're trying to catch them by surprise with something that, that you do believe that they do understand, right? So I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. And again, shenanigans, this is probably one of the most valuable lower level um, strategy types, lower rung strategy types that top players will use. Because the nice thing about shenanigans is that you are counting on your opponent to be unaware or not knowledgeable about a particular thing and if you're right it works out for you the really the really what it comes down to is not abusing shenanigans because once you the reason why they're called shenanigans is because the more your opponent sees them the more they realize it is a completely pointless tactic it is not based on any read it is not based on any strategy it's just you're just hoping your opponent is asleep at this particular time that you catch them with it that's the whole basis of a shenanigan 
because once you actually understand the shenanigan, you're never going to get caught by it again, right? So let's go back to the game here. I am going to record a shenanigan for you guys. Here is a perfect shenanigan. Okay, now let me play this back for you. And what this is, is trying to bait quick rise. Oh, she threw me, right? However, the funny thing about this is that I could have sworn that if you're crouching, the hooligan can't catch you. Isn't that the case? So if she uppercuts and then does a hooligan throw, the hooligan shouldn't be able to catch me while I'm crouching. Like that, right? So she just landed and threw me there. You can't actually grab a, a crouching character with this. So why did that happen? So I'm holding, I'm holding diagonally down here. I do a quick rise and I still get grabbed by this. This is a shenanigan. This is not a real viable tactic. This is not something that you should be basing your game around because, let me go back, if you know all about this tactic here, you know, I'm just going to uppercut her. That's, that's free every single time, right? That's, that's, I can uppercut that 100% of the time. I can ultra it 100% of the time. Boom, she's going to get hit. Useless tactic here. Um, in fact, I can even just do, whoops, hang on a second. I have to remember to quick rise. I can even mash low jab. I can mash low jab and get out of this shenanigan because that'll make me crouch right away. This is how useless this trick is. This is how useless this tactic is. It's not a very good tactic, but you'll see people do it and you'll see people use it in an actual tournament and it'll catch every once in a while because the opponent got hit by enough uppercuts that they're not even thinking about it. Then the hooligan comes and they're like, the hooligan, and then they get thrown and they get caught. So you get a little bit of free damage. But again, it's a shenanigan. It's not a solid piece of strategy. It is a tactic that you can just throw out there every once in a while and catch the opponent. Again, if I uppercut it and did that and caught somebody, and then I uppercut it and then did that, do the hooligan and caught them again, and did the uppercut, by the third time, they're going to know, right? Another perfect example of a shenanigan which is a beautiful shenanigan, probably one of the better shenan one of the higher quality shenanigans. And in fact, you know what, I'm not even going to bring it up because it's actually a really legitimate strategy and I don't want people to think that you shouldn't be using this. Um, well, I'll bring it up anyway because I talk about this a lot during the EVO, um, during Snake Eyes versus Fudo. Um, so such a good match oh man that's such a great match to watch you can learn so much about that but here th this is a shenanigan i mean it, it really is a shenanigan it just happens to be an extremely good shenanigan which is the zangief oops he's still on control that freaked me out for a second i was like why is where you moving <laughs> but, but this is a shenanigan this little crouching forward in the spd this is a shenanigan it is absolutely a shenanigan because what you're hoping you're doing is you're just catching your opponent asleep at the wheel and you get in close and you catch him with the SPD. Now keep in mind, Snake Eyes does this a lot. It's the basis of a lot of his strategies. But the reason why I call it a shenanigan is because you can't use it a lot. You just cannot abuse this trick. The more you abuse this trick, the less effective it becomes. And I mentioned this during commentary. Every time you do this, your opponent is now going to be aware of it. Because this is a slow move. Zangief is here for a very long time. I'm going to hold up. See, like, you have a long time to react to this and punish him. So the more often you use it, the less effective it's going to become. Thus, it's kind of a shenanigan you have to use it sparingly. You have to use it every once in a while because you have to make sure your opponent forgets it exists. And once you get your opponent to forget it exists, then you can use it again. And so you'll catch them asleep at the wheel, you'll catch them when they're not ready for it, etc, etc. So that's basically what I mean by a, shenan a shenanigan. It's, it's 
even though it's super effective and it's something that Snake Eyes used a lot, even in the matchup against Fudo, you saw that every time he landed it, he would not go to it again for a very long time. In fact, what he would try to do is erase its existence from memory by playing very careful footsie games and never using that button ever again. He never wanted to remind Fudo that that was a trick that he could use. So he stopped using crouch forward completely and went back to stand short, stand strong, you know, low jab, stand jab. He, he, he just took it out of his game because he's trying to get Fudo to forget about it. This is what he does to everybody. All the games, not even just the Fudo match. If you watch him, Snake Eyes versus everybody else, that's how he lands it is because he never uses that button except for that particular trick. And it's because he's trying to erase it from memory, thus making it a shenanigan. So, um, why did I call, um, Sako's little, um, here, I'll show you what I, I'll, I'll show you instead of trying to explain it. Um, at the end of Capcom Cup, and I said he goes for the shenanigans. It's because it really is just kind of a little okie doke trick. It's a little, you know, fun thing that you can do and hopefully catch your opponent off guard. <clears throat> yeah, actually, Trance God, that is kind of true. Shenanigans are really good for top players versus top players. And I'll get into this again at the end, because you're saving these tricks for the end. So even against someone like Xian, perfect example, I'm kind of just going right into there. Um, even against someone like Xian, Sako's trick is going to work pretty well. So here's this little hop kick thing. You know, very, very slow move. But the thing about the hop kick, though, is even though he looks like he's in the air, he's actually grounded. He's actually on the ground. So this is part of one of the things that makes it a shenanigan, is if you don't know he's on the ground, you're not sure you're trying to look for anything, right? So obviously I can cancel this into hurricanes or whatever like that, but the other thing I can cancel into is the raging demon, right? So what happens is that this is a really good footsie tool. It's a very good footsie tool. So a lot of the times, whenever someone busts it out, you're going to block. You're like, you know what, I've got to block this, I, I don't want to get caught by this move. So I'm not going to touch any buttons. So Sako does this move enough and gets Shin worried about this move. And so when he gets him with that, then, oh, I can't do it fast enough. Let's try again. There it is. Boom. So when you do a Raging Demon point blank to the opponent, they cannot jump away, right? So if I do this, whoops. So uh, let's see if I have a move that, um, dang it. I just, I just want to show you guys that you can't jump away from it, but whatever. Actually, I'll just do it by doing the shenanigan again, like this. So now I'm going to put the training to jump, like this. It's, it's, it's a zero frame super, basically. If he activates it next to you, you can't jump away from it. So what he ended up doing was he conditioned um, Shen to stay crouching all the time like this, right? And then at the very, very end, the last thing that he actually does is the shenanigan. And he catches him with it. And obviously Sokka is better at this than I am. So um, now I'm just trying it just, just for the sake of myself. But basically you can cancel it before it kicks them. And then in that case, they can't escape and you grab them. That's a shenanigan. That's why I called it a shenanigan during commentary. That's why I said, and he goes for the shenanigan, because it's a trick. But can you imagine if Sako did that to end one of the first games? If he did that to end one of the first games... Shin would be very aware of the fact that as soon as Sako builds up four bars, I'm going to be looking for this. I'm going to be looking for this. I'm going to be aware that this is a trick, so if I see him hop kick, I might actually just try to jump away. And if he ends up hitting me out of the air with this hop kick, it doesn't even really matter. I don't care because I'm not going to get hit by the, the Raging Demon anymore, right? So, whoops, red focus. So... It's just one of those things that you use one time and maybe only one time only. So that is basically what a shenanigan is. Um, but it can be valuable in real combat when used sparingly, which is what that bullet point says. Very, very important to understand that shenanigans can be useful. But if you base your whole game around shenanigans, it's no different than patterns. It's just basically more advanced tricks. It's more advanced sequences. You know, it's something that takes advantage. Uh, it's a very uncommonly seen thing. 
and so it can be used in high level play but it shouldn't be relied upon if your whole entire game is based on shenanigans you have a problem now there are some times when shen shenanigans transcend being a shenanigan so for example um Cammy can do uppercut hooligan throw against characters like Zangief or Abel because um, they actually have a hard time getting around it. Zangief has no throw invincible moves, so sometimes if he wakes up with EX Green Hand, you'll hooligan him anyway. If he wakes up with Lariat, you'll grab him anyway. Uh, if Abel rolls, you'll grab him if he doesn't wake up roll. So there are some times that it can be useful, but again, both Zangief and Abel can mash jab to escape that trick. So it's not great, but at least in those particular situations, you know if they are onto your shenanigan, you're not going to get punished as badly. You're going to get low jabbed out of the air or something like that, and that's the worst it's going to be. So it's worth it to go for that shenanigan because you know you can't get hurt by it. But against a, a Ryu, you do that shenanigan, uppercut FADC Ultra, you lose half your life. Why did I go? I mean, I have literally lost tournament matches because I went for uppercut hooligan at the end of a round and the guy uppercut FADC altered me and I'm just like why did I go for this shenanigan why didn't I just play smarter and play solid and trust in my own you know instincts and stuff like that so again sparingly they can be useful but definitely do not rely upon them keep them in your head keep them in your head they're they're a good thing to have in your pocket So let's get past shenanigans here. Let's go to character knowledge. Character knowledge, very, very, very important. So character knowledge is where things start. This is basically, I would say, the dividing point if you had to break things into halves. So the first half is, you know, the shenanigans, patterns, and one-player games. This is the first half of the ladder. Character knowledge is when you start getting into the second half of the ladder. And why is that? It's because you have a really, really strong understanding of the basic strengths and weaknesses of the character that you're playing. This is where you start becoming a character specialist. And what this ends up happening is it means you have a true game plan for your character. Sometimes you'll hear me and David when we do commentary, when a really strong player is going up against a player who's not as strong, we'll say, he doesn't look like he has a game plan. I don't think he has a game plan. What does that exactly mean? Well, it really just means, what are you trying to do with your character? You know, in a one player game where shenanigans are tricks, you're just like, I want to land this combo. I want to show off my cool swanky Marvel combo by landing this really, really cool tri-jump thing, right? And then your opponent's in the air and you're never going to catch him with it. And you're like, why can't I do these things? So character knowledge is where you actually have a game plan. You understand that with Magneto, you want to rush people down with tri-jumps. With Virgil, you want to mash buttons and win. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, <laughs> but um, you know, with Guile, I want to zone my opponent with Sonic Booms. This is my goal. With Cammy, my strategy is to get a throw or a knockdown and go into my ambiguous dive kicks, aka the Vortex kind of situation. You have a specific strategy for your character. You know what you're trying to go for. And the reason why this is starting to um, this is important is because not only do you know what your strategies, strengths, and weaknesses of your characters, you start becoming familiar with the unknown buttons. This is one of my favorite things about fighting games when you see someone using a button that you've never seen anybody use before, and uh, they make it super useful. You're like, holy crap! I didn't even know that was a good button. I didn't even know that was something you could use. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to improvise with your character. You know your character, you're a one with your character so good, so much, that when you run into a situation that you have never seen before, you kind of already know a good way around it. So let's just say your opponent, you're Rose, and your opponent likes to do low jab, walk up throw, low jab, walk up throw, low jab, walk up throw. When they throw you like three times or, or two times already, you're like, okay, he's throwing me a lot. How am I going to counter this? Wait, my character has a standing forward, which is, air, which is considered airborne instantly, which is unthrowable. 
So the next time he does low jab, walk up throw, I'm just going to hit forward kick because I know that puts me up into the air. So even without having been in that situation before, you can make up the solution to your character, to what you're losing to right there on the spot. You can make up a, you can create the solution to your problem. Remember when I said about tricks, that a lot of times when you're in that phase where you're still concentrating on tricks, and here's this trick and here's that trick, when an opponent hits you with a trick, you're like, I don't know how to counter this. I'm going to go home and figure out a way, find a way my own trick to counter this trick. But the problem is, that's not going to win you any matches in tournaments. It's not going to win you any matches online. You have to be able to adapt. You have to be able to improvise. You have to be able to create strategies on the fly. And that is what character knowledge gives you. By understanding where your overheads are, the fact that you have a shorter or longer range throw than other characters, that you have a better back dash, that your uppercut is seven frames invincible and your opponent's is only six frame of invincible. Actually, no, just understanding that your character has a seven frame invincible move, understanding what's airborne, understanding what's throw invincible, understanding all these kind of things. This is where you really start getting to the higher level of play when you finally understand what your character is capable of and can start making stuff up on the fly. This will get you very, very far. This You can do very well in tournaments based on character knowledge alone, having your own character knowledge, because this is the phase where you start learning to adapt. <clears throat> the part that is going to fail you, however, is when you fight against unfamiliar characters or you run into bad matchups. This is where the problem lies because you're going to be playing a character, for example, like <clears throat> you're going to play um, Oni, right? So when me and David were commenting Southern California Regionals earlier, see, we don't have that extensive knowledge of Oni, right? And um, Infiltration did. He knew that Chun-Li is really good against Oni. So he picked Chun-Li, so it's a bad matchup. So all of a sudden, Wow now has to deal with a bad matchup. Now, I'm not saying Wow was a bad player. He's an amazing player. But that's just an example right there. You run into a bad matchup, <clears throat> and you weren't aware of it. Me and David weren't aware of it at the time until a lot of people on Twitter let us know. You know, Chun-Li is a bad matchup for Oni. Oh, okay, that's good. So if I was Wow and I was the Oni player, I would run into Chun-Li, and I would get destroyed because I only knew my own character, and I didn't understand... Unf you know, unfamiliar characters and or bad matchups. And so that's why, after knowing everything about your character, the next rung that you want to get to is matchup knowledge. All right, so um, again, I'll get into matchup knowledge, but first I'm going to take a quick break and uh, I will be right back and go ahead and start asking some questions in the chat. Again, I, I like to read them because a lot of people ask me great stuff. I don't have the ability to look at the chat very well while I'm talking because I got to stare at the camera, right? I, I can't look to the side all the time. So, so definitely um, during break, go ahead and ask some questions and then I'll, I'll reiterate some of them on stream for you guys. All right, be right back.